There we go. All right. Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome. We're back to kind of a normal cadence of high days once a week now. It was a nice little feast. Kind of broke up in sort of two segments for us here, at least. We kind of had some more intense fellowship in the beginning part. And then some folks went other places. So, but it's good. God is good. So we will finish off today um, my review of Paul's letter to the Philippians. Think on these things. And so one of the things that I like very much about this particular epistle is that it's very upbeat. It's rejoice, joy. It's full of those things. And so I, I took a little look. How many times in compared to other places does he, Paul talk about rejoicing or being joyful? So I have created a rejoice meter with joy for you. So all the occurrences... So Paul in the New Testament, I didn't check Psalms, Psalms might be more, but Paul in the New Testament definitely is the writer that uses the term rejoice, rejoices, rejoice, rejoicing, joy, joys, the most of the writers in the New Testament. And so of those letters that one of those words occurs in, there's the list there on the screen. And so the first batch um, of the percent of verses uh, through 1 Corinthians to Timothy, 2 Timothy, Romans, Galatians, about 2% or less of the verses. Um, have that word in it. The next batch here um, goes up pretty good. So Colossians, 2 Corinthians, 1 Thessalonians, and Philemon. So Philemon actually only has two occasions of the word joy, but it's a very small letter, so that's a big percentage, but still 8%. But even with the advantage that Philemon has, Philippians just blows it out of the water. So Philippians... Is 13.46. That means essentially one in every eight, less than eight verses has the word rejoice or joy or some version thereof in in the in Philippians. So that's that's a very that's a very high concentration of rejoice and joy. And then not only just the the number of verses, but also the number of words. So Phil, um, Philippians also wins there as well with almost a whole percent of all the words that are in the the letter. So broke it all down. I got my little I got my little spreadsheet here that I won't share on but I got my little spreadsheet and everything. So I just that's one of the, one of my things about Philippians that I like, you know, you like Philippians 3 1 that where he's, he's like not it's not good enough just once. He's like rejoice. And again I say rejoice. It's like rejoice, rejoice, joy. So that being said, we will go ahead and jump into chapter two. And we'll start off in verses 1 through 4. So Paul here continues on. And remember, as we talked in context of chapter 1, he's in prison. He's kind of covered the point that, I don't know if I'm going to live or die. I mean, we don't know. But he, he has confidence in the one that he serves and that in any case, he will not be harmed by it, even if he dies, that all things will work out good for him. And it also will work out good for the gospel, no matter what happens. So then he kind of picks that thought up here in chapter 2. He says, If therefore there be any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, and if any bowels of mercies, fulfill you my joy that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem of the other better than themselves. Look not every man to his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So Paul essentially is saying, look, I want you guys to do good. That's If you want to make me happy, I want you to do good. Do good. Do these things. If you really want to make me, if you really want to make me happy, then do these things. Stick with them. Um, Paul isn't here concerned about them he doesn't want them to be concerned for him also here so he talks about he tells them he tells them to let nothing be done through strife or vainglory but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves and then let each man look not on his own things but on things of others so there's no evidence here that he is admonishing them for this, for them doing this, that this is a, a pervasive problem in Philippi. Uh, he's simply encouraging them. These are the kind of things that trip 
congregations up. These are the most common things that happen in groups of believers. People get, you know, they get their focus on themselves. They don't think of others. They think of themselves. They don't esteem each other. You know, they, they above themselves. They want, you know, the power or the glory or whatever. And so he's just warning them because he may not, he probably will not ever get a chance to see them again. So, so the next set of verses, um, verses 5 through 11 in Philippians chapter 2 are called by some known as the Carmen Christi or the Christ hymn, the song of Christ. Um, so because it speaks of his divinity. They, these verses speak of his divinity. So we'll look into this a little bit. Carmen just means a song in Latin. And Christi, of course, is Christ. So Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7a. I have the King James on the screen here now. We'll look at the J.B. Phillips in a minute. So let this mind be in you. So think this way, which also was in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. So this on the tales of what he was just talking about, think of others and not yourself. Don't get strife or vain glory and use Christ as an example. I have uh, the same verse here, the same verses of the J.B. Phillips paraphrase here. Let Christ himself be your example as to what your attitude should be. For he, who had always been God by nature, did not cling to his prerogatives as God's equal, but stripped himself of all privilege by consenting to be a slave. So that if, Paul really brings it home here as far as using Christ as an example. If there was somebody who had the right to say, look, <laughs> I really shouldn't be doing this stuff. I shouldn't be washing your feet. I, I mean, I, I made your feet. I made everything. You guys are the ones that are messing it all up. If there was anybody that could rightfully make that claim, it would be Christ, certainly. And yet he did exactly the opposite. He set the example. And so that's what Paul is he's using here as an example. Let Christ be your example. Um, let Christ be your example. So carrying on in this uh, Carmen Christi. So that's one area where Paul makes it clear about Christ is different than any other human being. He is God. And he took, to a certain extent, however that works out, however he could be God and man here at the same time, I have no clue. I don't know, but I believe it's true because that's what Scripture says. And he, unique among all human beings that has ever lived or ever will live, he did that. So again, that's just evidence of his divinity, that he is different than any other human being that has ever existed or ever will exist. Carrying on, verses 7 through 8. But he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. As an example, Paul is using him here. Paul goes on here in verses 9 through 11. Or actually, no, I, oh, that's right. This is Hebrews 2, 9 to 11. This is kind of the, so Paul didn't write this here, I don't think. I don't think he wrote Hebrews, but nonetheless, um, here in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 9 to 11, the author tells us here, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. For it became him, for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies and he that who those who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So again, just Paul is using this in Hebrews, just reiterates what Paul wrote in Philippians that we just read, that he's using Christ as an example. That if Christ did these things, if this is how Christ conducted himself when he was here in the flesh, and again, if there was anybody who had the right to not lower himself down to the menial things because he had never sinned, he, not only was he God, but he also, even in the flesh, had never sinned. So if there was anybody who had the right or the prerogative to say, no, I, I, that's those things are below me, it would have been him. And yet he did exactly the opposite. 
So certainly we don't have the ability to claim that we are better than Christ. And that's the point that Paul's making. So we will go back to Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. And he goes on and says, Wherefore God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. And again, it's above Moses, it's above Adam, it's above Paul, it's above all of the apostles, it's above all of the prophets, all the saints of old, it's above David, it is above every name. We see a couple more examples of that in Acts chapter 4, verse 12. This is Peter and John talking about Jesus. And Peter says here, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby men must, whereby we must be saved. And one more place in Romans 3.24, Paul writes, Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So in these verses, along the lines of the divinity of Jesus, make it clear that he is different than any other person. And it's not because as some would look at him because he came and lived such a pure life, such a holy life, that he earned this status. No, he already had this status. He was perfect God before he ever came here. He didn't need to earn anything. But yet he showed us the example by coming here and suffering. He put on the flesh. Many other verses I don't have, so just for your notes, if you want, so Luke 24, 26. John 10, 17, Isaiah 11, 10, John 17, 5, and Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 2. Those are all other, other verses that emphasize the divinity of Christ. No other human being has ever been elevated to that point, not even close. Uh, additionally, the, as far as what we have in Scripture, there is no other entity that has been elevated. So the Holy Spirit, for example, is never spoke of in that fashion. The Holy Spirit is never glorified. It's never lifted up. We are not, we are not um, told to pray in the name of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is not given a role in the same sense that Jesus is whatsoever. There are some verses in John and such that seem to, to phrase it uh, in a way that the, the, the Holy Spirit is another entity, um, I think that's just anthropomorphizing or making it kind of giving it a human shell so that it can be easier to understand the comforter. But nonetheless, even in those cases, it never says to um, trust in the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is our Lord, that the Holy Spirit is our Savior. Only God is our Savior. And we know now that God the Father is our Savior. There's plenty of verses that say that. And God the Son is our Savior and our Lord as well. So, now here's another set of verses. And this was, the, to me, this is one of the most clear places in the New Testament where if, if Jesus, the Son of God, is not God himself, then this is absolute blasphemy, what we're going to read here. Completely, 100% blasphemy, if that's not true. Here in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, Paul writes, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here it's clear, Paul is clearly saying that every knee is going to bow to the name of Jesus, everything in heaven and in earth, and everything's going to confess Jesus' name. Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 45, verses 22 through 24. Paul essentially is quoting this. So in Isaiah 45, 22 through 24, we read here, and in, in Isaiah, this obviously is the God of Israel. When you read this, this, this is talking of the God of Israel, the one that brought them out of Egypt, the one that followed them in the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, the one that dwelt between the cherubim above the, the Ark of the Covenant, the one that saved them. This was the rock that followed them. This was Jeshurun, Jeshurun that they forgot. This is the one and only God that Israel dealt with. So we see here in Isaiah 45, 22 through 24, look unto me and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. So it wasn't just for Jews. Everybody on the earth, look unto me and be saved. For I am God and there is none else. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return 
that unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. Surely shall one say, and the Lord have I righteousness and strength, even to him shall men come. And all that are in, 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 <clears throat> incensed against him shall be ashamed. So Paul directly uses this and makes it clear that the one that this is talking about is Jesus. The one that we know as Jesus, the Son of God, who walked in the flesh. So if he is not God, then those verses that we just read in the Philippians are the first order blasphemy. I mean, completely. And, and if, if Paul is capable of that level of blasphemy, then everything that he says should be discounted and everything the New Testament says should be discounted. And that's where many people get tripped up in Paul's writings. And one of the places where they get tripped up in Paul's writings and in the New Testament, because they refuse to believe, as it says here in the very end of Isaiah 45, 24, and all that are incensed against him shall be ashamed. Those who do not have the son do not have the father. Those who reject Jesus Christ, the son of God, and the sacrifice that he provided for the forgiveness of our sins, do not have the Father, and they are not his. And that's exactly what this verse in Isaiah is saying, and that is exactly the point that Paul makes in Philippians chapter 2, verses 11 or 10 and 11 that we read just a slide before this. But to me, that's one of the, the clearest places in the New Testament where it talks about the place in the Godhead of Jesus Christ. And no other, there's no one else that even comes close to that. You can't put Moses in these verses here. You can't put John the Baptist in these verses. Those are all holy men. They're great men. You can't put any of the apostles or anybody except Jesus Christ, who is God. And you can only put Jesus Christ in these verses if you understand and believe that he truly is God and the Son of God. Check out my notes there. So if, if there's anyone that hears this and you are struggling with doubts about what is Paul saying here, how can he possibly say that Jesus is the one that was with Israel? I ask that you pray for the Heavenly Father to open your eyes to his son, because if you reject his son, you will lose salvation. It is only by his son's name and by the sacrifice that he, he performs that you can have salvation. And I believe these next couple verses here, Paul continues to drive home the difference between the covenant that is available, as it says here, um, to all the ends of the earth, between the covenant that was made to Israel. So carrying on Philippians chapter 2, verse 12a, Paul says here, Wherefore, beloved, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So he's saying, you've always obeyed. Well, how can he say that? Especially in light of, let's go to Deuteronomy 31, and I'm going to read just the first part of verse 29, but actually there's a lot in, in these verses, but this kind of captures the sense of it. This is Moses speaking just as he's about to pass the reins over to Joshua and die. Um, he says here to Israel, for I know that after my death, you will utterly corrupt yourselves. It's exactly opposite of what Paul is saying. He says, even if I'm, whether I'm there or not, you have obeyed. Moses says, and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because you will do evil in the sight of the Lord. This is exactly the opposite of what Paul is saying to the writers of Philippians. Why? Because Paul hates his, his own flesh and blood? Well, of course not. Definitely he does not hate that. Uh, why is Paul doing this? Because Paul is writing to believers under the new covenant. In Deuteronomy, Moses is talking to those men and women who are under the Old Covenant. The Old Covenant was not sufficient. It did not bring about life. That's the whole point that the writer of the Hebrews makes very expressly, but the New Testament makes. This is a stark difference, and Paul is doing, he uses this, this he uses even more, more stark comparison here in a couple verses later, but he's using this to illustrate the confidence that we can have in the New Covenant by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Not like the old covenant, 
where it's like, well, I know you got you got the stuff on the tablets, you got all the, you got everything, you got all the things we wrote in the book, you got the Ark of the Covenant, you have all that stuff, and yet I know is when I die, you're going to corrupt yourselves, and you're not going to do it just once. You're going to do it generation after generation after generation after generation. So Paul here waxes very bold and very confident in the spirit that indwells him and that indwells the saints that he is writing to, the spirit of God. So even much more in my absence. So carrying on in the second half of verse 12 and then verse 13 in Philippians chapter 2, we see Paul says here after that, just after he says, um, but now much more in my absence, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Because they're believers. They have God's spirit. As opposed to those who were going across the Jordan into the promised land, the majority of those, the vast majority of those, did not have the spirit. And if Paul was writing this epistle to the Philippians to the entire population of the city of Philippi, then he would have to phrase it in the same way Moses did. He'd say, I know you've been listening to me now, but I know as soon as I go away, you're going to go and corrupt yourselves and do all kinds of stuff because that's the truth of any population. But since the new covenant is a believer's covenant, and Paul is writing to the believers in Philippi here, he can make these statements. It's not that the people in Philippi were superior morally to those who were with Moses in the wilderness as they were about to go across the Jordan, because there were people there who had God's spirit, Joshua, Caleb, others. There were people who had his spirit, and they did. And, and in that sense, to those people, Moses could have spo spoke these similar words to them as well. That I know you've obeyed, not just in my presence, but Joshua, I know as soon as I'm gone, you're going to continue on in obedience to God. Caleb, you're going to continue on. So here in Hebrews 12, verse 2, we see here again, as, he, as Paul said in, in verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So we have to work things out. So God gives us things to do. There is obedience. There are things, things we must do, but we're not saved by those things. And we needn't fear, for it's God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So as long as we submit to him, our desires will be aligned with his desires. We'll have the ability to do the things that he would have us do, and we have nothing to fear. So the writer to Hebrews here in chapter 12, verse 2 says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. So he started our faith by his sacrifice, and he will finish our faith by his spirit and by the strength that he gives us. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. So this work it out doesn't mean that we earn our salvation. There's another one of my favorite verses in Philippians is that work. This was early on in my Christianity, though. This was one of the verses that was some of the other ones seemed almost too stark. The ones out of Hebrews and Peter, um, as far as you can lose your salvation. But this verse here gave me confidence at the same time. It was one of the first verses that really, when I first came into Christianity, I came into typical Christianity, and many of the people that I encountered were the once saved, only saved kind of, always saved. I never really believed that, but I mean, there was a battle going on in my spirit about, well, is that going to... So this was one of the verses for me that kind of I was able to hold fast to and says, well, there's still work for me to do. I can't just, it's not greasy grace. I don't earn it. At the same time, it says here, it's God that does it. So I don't earn it, but at, but there are things that I must do. So if my fruits, if I don't bear fruit of obedience and the fruit of the spirit, then I should seriously doubt my salvation. And this is one of the verses that helped me form that truth within myself. So carrying on to uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. Paul says here, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a cro crooked and perverse nation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. So now these were Philippians, so the nation they were in the midst of was Rome. It was definitely a crooked and a perverse 
nation. Absolutely it was. But Paul, I believe, uses that phrase because it's almost a direct quote from Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 5. They, Israel, have corrupted themselves. Their spot is not the spot of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. So here's his generation, nation. So Paul, again here, I believe, is using these words to illustrate the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. Philippi is written to believers. Moses was speaking to a nation of people, most of whom did not have a heart for God. And if Paul was writing to a nation, any nation, he would be writing to mostly people who do not have a heart for God. He uses the word spot here in Deuteronomy 32, 5. That just means a mark or an identifying characteristic. So you're, the way you live your life, the identifying care, the things that people see about you are not the things that people would see um, of the children of God. That's what he's saying. Moses is saying in Deuteronomy 32, verse 5. So here's another example where Paul is very encouraging, and he's using words that connect directly to the Old Covenant, and he's using that as a contrast. And so as I had spoken in part one, when Paul first encountered both uh, Lydia and her household, and then the Philippian jailer and his household, back in Acts chapter 16, when, they, when he first went to Philippi, they probably didn't, they would not have connected or even known these references, I imagine, at that time. So this is many years later. They, I'm sure, have read the scriptures by then. By this time, they have read it. So these connections would make more sense to them now. I don't know how many years this was afterwards. And we don't have any, really any estimates, anything valid, at least, as far as how many believers there were in Philippi at the time that he was writing this letter. But it could, I always, in my mind, imagine these big groups of people. But I, I, it could have been. I mean, we see, the only time where we see where there's numbers of people is early on, and they were all Israelites when 5,000 were baptized, 3,000 were baptized. Otherwise, it's just the household here, a household there. Now, certainly were the Philippians, the Philippian believers filled with the Spirit of God. Uh, Lydia obviously had some influence. Uh, the Philippian jailer also obviously had some influence. So they may have, there may have been a, uh, quite a revival in the city of Philippi. There might have been a thousand believers there or so. Remember, the population was about 10,000 or so. Maybe the entire city got converted. I doubt it, but it is possible. But I still tend to think that these groups were much smaller than we think about. I mean, they were just, they were groups of believers, just, just like today. Most people choose the, the wide road. It's unfortunate, but it's true. That's why Paul here can talk about their light. If, if everybody in Philippi was a Christian, they wouldn't be much of a light to the other Philippians because they'd all be doing the same thing. So it's in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. Carrying on, verses 16 through 18. Holding forth the word of life that I might rejoice in, in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain, yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. So here's, again, Paul is telling them, I rejoice because God's word goes forth. And all these things that are unfolding are for his good and for his glory. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ or Jesus Christ's. But you know the proof of him, that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. So Timothy, as I said before, although it doesn't expressly say that Timothy was there in jail with Paul and Silas in Acts chapter 16, just earlier, earlier in that chapter is where they met up with Timothy and Paul circumcised Timothy so that he could bring Timothy along with him to minister. So I expect Timothy was as well when they first met the Philippians. Um, 
So here, again, Paul is just saying, look, just keep doing this stuff. Keep Hold fast to him. If you want to make me happy, if you're concerned about my, my state, my emotional state, how I'm doing, if you want to make me happy, let me know that you're just doing this stuff. Just let me know, as you always have done, that you're continuing to do this stuff. Now he says here, but I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. Yet I suppose it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. So you know what that's like if people you care about, if they know you're sick or Half of you is like, well, I don't even want to tell them because I don't want them to worry about me. I mean, I'm like, you're going to be okay. You know, I don't want to worry about me. So that's what Paul is saying here. It's like uh, Epaphroditus, he, heard, he, he knew you knew he was sick, and so you were concerned for him. So for indeed, he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. And here I think Paul is just talking about the sorrow that he would experience for Epaphroditus' death, and then additionally, Paul would be sorrowful because he would know the Philippian believers were grieving as a result of that. Carrying on more here about Epaphroditus in verses 28 through 30. I sent him, therefore, the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. So here, lack of service doesn't mean they were slacking and they were being um, disobedient or ignoring him. They weren't able to. So I have the Good News Bible translation of that last uh, verse 30 there. Here, Because he risked his life and nearly died for the sake of the work of Christ in order to give me the help that you yourselves could not give. So it doesn't tell us what he might have, like the Romans might have caught him and beat him because he was helping Paul, or he might have got some kind of illness, or it doesn't say what it was. But whatever it was, Paul says here that he it was in this because of the work of Christ, he was eyeing to death. So we tend to think that anything that happens to us is, oh, I'm being persecuted for the word of God. Well, no, that most of the time that's not the case. So if we catch like a cold or something or whatever, generally that's not on me. You know, I'm, I got sick because of the work of Christ. Now, maybe if you're going into um, a leper's ward in a hospital to preach the gospel and you catch leprosy, then maybe that might qualify for that. But for the most part, so whatever he was doing, whatever happened to Epaphroditus, we don't know, but it was, he was, he was deliberately putting his life in jeopardy for the word of Christ, for God and for the saints. Um, the Net Bible translates that verse, since it was because of the work of Christ that he almost died, he risked his life so that he could make up for your inability to serve me. So again, lack of service doesn't mean they were didn't want to. They, they were unable to serve him. And it, it could very well be that if he was in prison, I'm sure that it went in cycles or there were times where they were like, well, no, you can't have any visitors, Paul. We're cutting you off. And then, so it might have been the case where they couldn't. They weren't letting them in. And maybe Epaphroditus snuck in or something and got caught. Don't know. It's all conjecture. But whatever it was, he was risking, risking his life almost unto death for the word of God and for Paul. So I'm going to go a little out of order here in Philippians just because there's a couple other verses that deal with Epaphroditus, and I think the context makes it easier to jump to those two. So in Philippians 4.10, we see here, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again, wherein you were careful, but you lacked opportunity. And careful in this case here, care and careful, they mean full of care, concerned. They were concerned, but they lacked opportunity. And then in verse 18 of chapter 4, we see here, But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent of you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice, acceptable, well-pleasing to God. So I put those there because they kind of are connected better with the verses we just read out of chapter 2. 
So Epaphroditus apparently was from Philippi and he had gone to visit Paul and was able to bring, don't know what, he was able to bring aid, comfort to Paul. Yes. So moving on, we'll go to chapter three, verse one. So he says here, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. So I believe that Paul is talking about the things that are coming up here, not the things that he had already written when he says that um, it's not grievous, but for you, it is safe to write these things, to say these things to you, that he may not say these to other brethren in this same fashion because they might not be able to take them or they might take and twist them. Verses 2 and 3, Paul says here, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. So there is no evidence that the Philippian church suffered any significant persecution from unbelieving or over, overly zealous Jews. They were, they were in the neighborhood. We know they were in Thessalonica, which wasn't too far away, and they were in Berea. Um, but there is no evidence that that particular problem existed in Philippi. That's another reason why I think that the, the, the church at Philippi was fairly small. It was mostly a pretty tight-knit group, um, and the Jews just didn't really pay attention to them. There was no synagogue in Philippi. There was no real reason for the Jews to go to Philippi. In fact, for the most part, most Jews probably wouldn't even enter the city walls because it was just an unclean, horrible Roman city, and there would be no reason for them to go there. So this isn't an admonition as if we read in Galatians, where he says, oh, you foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? But here, since Paul, the tenor of this letter is that this may be the last words that he gets to say to them, he's just warning them about things that commonly have happened. He's already warned about internal strife and and, and thinking of others above yourself. And now he's going to warn them about things that commonly happened in a lot of congregations throughout the new world. So here he says the concision. So this, he's making a clear allusion to either unbelieving or overly zealous for the law Jews who have come into other congregations and caused trouble, like we read about in Acts chapter 15, for example. And Acts chapter 21. He uses that word concision. It's the only place that he that, that word appears in the New Testament at all. It's the only place he uses it. But obviously, concision is talking about being cut off. So he uses that as double meaning. He uses it as these people, if you listen to these people, you will be cut off from the saints. But also he uses it as an allusion to his own brethren and the circumcision, definitely. And we can see that in the next verse because he says, For we are the circumcision which worships God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Carrying on. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any man other than, if any other man thinks that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. If you read especially 2 Corinthians, it seemed really clear. That's one of the probably the most stark places in Paul's epistles where it was real clear that people had gone in behind Paul and spoke ill of Paul and said, that Paul guy, he's wacko. He doesn't, you got to listen to us, not him. And they had all kinds of reasons. And Paul is real, real stern warning the believers in Corinth about having fallen victim to a willing victim to the the heresies that those people were speaking. And so he says, so he's using the same thing here. He's saying, look, if you want to trust in the flesh, I more. So none of you Philippians essentially were circumcised the eighth day, were you? Of the stock of Israel? Nope, you ain't none of those. Of the tribe of Benjamin? Uh-uh. And Hebrew of the Hebrews? Nope. As touching the law of Pharisee? Nope. None of you was that. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. So even that, I'm like, I was... Paul is, he's not bragging about himself, but he's saying, look, if there was anybody that could brag and would have a place to brag, it would be me. Touching the righteousness, which is of the law, blameless. So he lays that all out essentially as a roadblock 
that the Philippians can hold in mind in the future if somebody comes along and tries to undermine the authority that God gave Paul to, to work with them. Paul gives them this and says, don't listen to them. And then he goes on to say, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. So he's saying, you're not going to have, nobody else is going to be able to come along and give you a better pedigree than I have. And yet, that whole pedigree doesn't mean nothing. It means anything, nothing at all. I count it all loss for Christ. Carrying on, verses 8 through 10. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Uh, it's just pretty straightforward. Paul is, hold on to this, Philippians. This is just hold on to this. If somebody comes along and tries to bewitch you like they did the Galatians, don't listen to them. Hold on to this. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had ta already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after. If that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's a lot better soliloquy than Shakespeare ever came up with. And et tu brute doesn't even come close. That's just a, a great, Paul is making such a great example of his own experience and what God has shown him to encourage the saints. Don't listen to anybody who's going to come along and tell you that your confidence is in the flesh. It's not. But if you want to be perfect, let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. What minded? How minded? That we trust in Christ. The things that he was just laid out, that's how we should be thus minded. So there may be some doctrinal differences, some things we haven't figured out, some things maybe we disagree on, but in the things that are important, let us be like-minded. And if anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. And that's, just, that's what he was talking about in the previous chapter. That think on the things of others. Don't be high-minded about yourself. Don't look for vain glory. Paul here says, nevertheless, weren't you already attained? Let us walk in the same rule. Let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. This is one of the places where Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians 4.16. He says a similar, wherefore I beseech you, be you followers of me. 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. And ye became followers of us and the Lord, having received the word and much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. And then again, a little later in this, this in chapter 4, he says a similar thing. Ephesians 5, 1. He says, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. So these things, so Paul says this. Does Paul think he's God? Of course not. But I was thinking about this again as I was going through this. And it really should be true if someone new wanted to know, well, what is it like being a Christian? I should be able to say, follow me around for a week. Just follow me around for a week when I go to work, when I drive, whatever, you know. Follow me around and all the stuff that I do. That's what it's like to be a Christian. I mean, not to brag about myself, not to make me great or anything, but it really it should be at, at any given moment. That's what Paul is saying here. Follow me. Do what I do. If you want to know what it's like, we often, that's, a lot of times those are the, the difficult things to pick up. It's like, okay, well, so how do I walk this stuff out on a daily basis? Well, there should be people that have been doing that for quite a time. That can be the example of that. And they should, not in their own confidence, but in the confidence of God, be able to say, do what I do. 
you want to know what to do, do what I do. And then he goes on and sort of um, sadly warns them again. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. There are many who don't do the things that Paul does. And they're enemies of the cross. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, glory is their shame, and they mind earthly things. And he finishes this chapter up here. With our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. He does the work. We have to work it out, but he's the one that provides the means. He provides the guidance. He gives us the strength to do it and even the desire to do it. So moving on to chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved, I beseech Eodius and beseech Syntyche, that they be of the same mind in the Lord. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, Help these these women or those women, which and so we'll stop right there because I want to do the those women part. So the Eodius and Syntyche, I believe those are the women, those are female names. So those are the those women that and who the, the yoke fellow is, we'll talk about that on the next when I finish this slide up here. But he says here, but I beseech Eodius and Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. So we have no more details about who they were or if there was a real stark or bad disagreement with them or just a minor disagreement or we don't know what it was but paul is just saying look be of the same mind but it can't be real serious because anytime there was a serious matter he would get into details he would get in you read corinthians galatians um most of the most of his other epistles he talks about that so we're staying on the same same verses here just a different set of words emphasized so it starts off here in the, the bold red letters, and I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow. So this apparently is the person that the letter was actually written to. So um, Epaphroditus carried the letter from Paul to Philippi, but apparently he gave it to this person, whoever that we don't know who this person is. It's not Timothy, obviously. And he says, I might send Timothy later. Um, but it was, so it was probably the elder, the pastor, you know, the, the bishop of Philippi. I'm sure he wouldn't have called that, but nonetheless, the, so that that he carried this letter to to be shared with the congregation of course but so and then he says to help these women which labored with me in the gospel that's again referring back to Iodius and Syntyche and with Clement also and with other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life and he can say this because he is writing to believers Moses would not be able to say that in Deuteronomy as he addressed the entire nation he would not be able to say you're all, your names are in the book of life. Moses knew there was a book, but he wouldn't be able to say that about them. Why? Is it because these people are better than the Israelites? No. It's because there's two different audiences that are being addressed. Moses was addressing the nation of Israel, a group of people who had a covenant, but it wasn't a believer's covenant. And Paul here is addressing saints who have a covenant, which is a believer's covenant which means that none of them need to tell their neighbor, know the Lord, because they already all know the Lord. We don't speak in word, terms like that much today. The thing about, oh, if you want to know how to be a Christian, follow me, do what I do, or this year, well, I know your names are written in the book of life. I think that's because our faith and our understanding of who he is and what he does is weaker than what we read about here. Carrying on, verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. 
Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. The peace of God, which passes all understanding. So the next three verses, 8 through 10, I'll flip a slide up here in a second. So 8, we're gonna, I'm going to skip, and we're going to cover that at the end. Um, and then verse 9, we already talked about. That was uh, in connection with chapter 3, verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me. And then verse 10, we already covered. That was in connection with Epaphroditus and their lack of service. So I'm going to skip over those, and then we'll come back to 8. So verses 8 through 10. We've covered in part, and verse 8 we'll cover at the end. So I'm skipping to verse 11 now. Not that I ever speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am thereto to be content. And I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And that's a verse that's taken out of context a lot of times as well. But he means what it means, absolutely, as long as it is according to God's will. And anything that God wants me to do, he gives me the power and ability to do it. And that certainly is true. But a lot of the, the word of faith movement people use this verse here to say, look, that's why you got to speak stuff into existence, whatever it is. So um, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And sometimes people get sick. So Epaphroditus got very sick, almost unto death. So Paul said he was almost dead. Paul didn't say, well, pff, I knew he wasn't going to die. He was almost dead. Sometimes believers die. It happens. So there's just evidence right there that the basic premise of the Word of Faith movement is, is false because all the apostles are dead. So what? Because they didn't have enough faith? Paul's dead. What? Because they didn't have enough faith to pray that he wouldn't die? No. Um, in first Timothy chapter six, verses six through eight, Paul writes here, but godliness with contentment is great gain for we brought nothing into this world and it's certain we can carry nothing out having food and raiment. Let us be there with content. So Paul's talking about contentment here. This is always the, the, the balance that, that leaders, any, anybody, um, mothers and fathers in a household, uh, leaders in, in a, in a congregation, always have to walk that balance of there are things that are required of people to do, but it's not really that the, the joy isn't from, well, okay, now you're obeying me. So now I'm happy because you're doing what I'm telling you to do. But as Paul says here, it's like, it's not that I needed it. It's that I'm glad you are doing what you're supposed to be doing. He takes joy in the fact that and so for good parents, if good parents give, ta uh, give tasks to children that they're supposed to do, then parents may be glad that the, the children do those things. But more importantly, the parents should be glad that the children are reaping the benefits of doing what they're supposed to do. We actually only have one parent here right now so <laughs> in our little group. And he goes on to kind of expound on that idea in these next set of verses here. Notwithstanding, you have done well that you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but you only. And remember in Acts 16 and Acts 17, he went to Philippi and they left there and he went in Acts 17 to Thessalonica and then from there to Berea. So he was kind of, they were out in unknown territory. They had never been that far west on a mission trip at that time. And Philippi, they sent assistance along to him at that time. And so that's what Paul's referring to here. For even at Thessalonica, he sent once and again under my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. So it's it's when you see, you know, like a, a little brother do something nice for his little sister. It's like, well, that's good, but it's nice to know that the little brother has the ability in his heart to be able to do that. That's what really makes a, a parent happy. That's what Paul's talking about here. Uh, in the Apostle John, in 3 John chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he says kind of the same thing. 
He says, for I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in me, even as you walk in the truth, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in the truth. And that's what Paul is saying here, essentially. It's not that he, not that Paul is like, oh, I need stuff. I need you to send me stuff. He might need some things, but that's not the real joy that he gets from that. Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor, a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, and we well pleasing to God. And then the closing verses here in Philippians, and then we'll go back to verse 8 and a couple other slides. Uh, verses 19 through 23. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Salute every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren which are with me greet you. All the saints salute you, chiefly they that are of Caesar's household. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. So just this is, in Paul's mind, perhaps the last words he'll ever say to these people that he cared for dearly. So just the, the fact that this letter is so short and, and essentially does not have any admonition in it other than possibly, you know, tell um, Syntyche and Eodius to not argue and whatever their thing is, work it out. And that's a very mild, just one little sentence. Um, this letter is full of praise, love, encouragement, and edification. So before we get to verse 8, one other place. So verse 8 is one of my favorite verses. Um, but there's a few places where Paul kind of does that. Actually, in chapter 1, we read a prayer that Paul had for the people that could actually be kind of bullet pointed as things that he was praying for. Um, it's a great prayer. In Thessalonians, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 22, he kind of has some bullet points, some things that he prays for the people. So here I'll just read through these in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 22. He tells them to rejoice evermore, to pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not, despise not prophesying. Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good, and abstain from all appearance of evil. Encouraging things. These are, you know, strive for these things. Keep these things in mind. Think on these things, although he doesn't use that phrase in First Thessalonians, but he does here as we close out in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, Think on these things. So if you find yourself not thinking on things like this or things like the list that we read out of 1 Thessalonians, then you are falling victim and you are heading in the wrong direction. You're falling victim to your own mind because God's Spirit, these are the things, if, if we don't allow these to be pervasive in us, then we will be filled with fear and anxiety and doubt, discomfort. But if we will think on these things by the Spirit, this isn't some kind of magic spell. It's not some kind of little trick or gimmick. But if we will allow, because these things are from God's Spirit. What, what, what's true? It comes from God. What's honest? comes from God. Just. All these things come from God. So if we will think on these things, if we will allow these to be the forefront in our mind and in our spirit, then we will be sensitive to the Spirit and the prompting of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit. And we will be true yoke fellows of our Heavenly Father and His Son, Jesus Christ. And we will truly be able to say, follow me. Because I know Him and I'm following Him. So, All right, brothers and sisters, thank you very much. Godspeed. Enjoy the rest of the Sabbath.